On behalf of RSM Australia, welcome everybody to our Fraud and Corruption Control Hindsight, Insight and Foresight uh, National Webinar. And this falls beautifully within International Fraud Awareness Week, which is this week. Um, before we commence and I introduce my colleagues, um, I begin our national webinar today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. For me and some of you, it is the traditional land in Melbourne of the Wurundjeri people, part of the Kulin Nation. For others on this national webinar, I also acknowledge your traditional owners and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be presenting today and uh, we have over 400 registrants, so um, much appreciated for you to show your interest and, and logging on or getting a copy of the recording and slides at a later date if you didn't get a chance to actually um, watch live. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the Q&A, feel free to put um, questions in the Q&A function and we'll leave the questions to the end. Although I did notice one, which is, will we get a copy of the recording? And yes, you will get um, a follow-up email from our fellow national marketing uh, people who I thank for um, doing a great job in assisting us and, and working with us to produce this webinar. And that will have a copy of the recording. It will have a copy of the slides. Uh, and also it will have our contact details um, for you to, if you want to, contact us and have a um, no obligation complimentary discussion with you about your organisation on this topic. Um, it'll also include a survey where you can provide your feedback and also um, nominate some other topics that you might be interested in in the future that we can um, include or have as part of uh, future webinars. So I'm going to introduce my co-presenters and teammates from RSM Australia's Fraud and Forensic Services. So um, we have myself, Roger Darbell Stevens, as the partner and head of Fraud and Forensic Services, my um, senior manager, Malin Sheth, and manager, Chris Scott. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, please, Chris, he's gonna do the driving of the slides. And just briefly to introduce myself, uh, because whenever I go to a presentation, um, I do like to hear about what's the credentials of the presenter. Um, so over 30 years of experience in forensic work, um, I, prior to RSM, uh, for the last eight years, I was um, at one of the big four. I started my career as um, a police person, so as a detective also in, um, uh, well, criminal investigation units and um, the drug squad, fraud squad, and a counter-terrorist area. Um, I have the qualifications, including MBA, Master of Arts, Criminology, and I'm, of course, a, a certified fraud examiner, CFE, um, licensed investigator, and other qualifications and experience um, as we go. Melinda, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Roger, and good afternoon, everyone. So Melinda Sheth is my name. I am a senior manager in the Fraud and Forensic Services team here in RSM Australia. I have 14 years of experience in this field. I've worked at a big four myself and also worked at a started my career in a boutique a forensic accounting practice. I'm a chartered accountant. Uh, I do love my numbers, uh, but uh, I do not have a traditional audit background. I went straight into forensics, which I absolutely adore and love and continue uh, to love going forward. Um, similar to Roger, I'm a certified fraud examiner, licensed investigator. I'm also the vice president and treasurer of the ACFE Melbourne chapter in Victoria. And we'll be running a, an event in a couple of weeks in person, uh, but we do run hybrid events. Uh, so, you know, we'd love to have as many of you at those events. Uh, qualifications there on the slide, which I won't go through, but you know, you collect those uh, uh, throughout your career. That's enough about me. Thank you, Roger. Chris. Thanks, Melinda. Uh, my name's Chris. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Chris. Um, I'm a manager in the Fraud and Forensic Services team at RSM. Um, so I have over seven years professional services experience. Um, I started my career in external audit, um, but please don't hold that against me. 
Um, but I saw the light and came across to fraud and forensic services a few years ago. Um, I'm a chartered accountant, certified fraud examiner, authorised trainer for the CV exam review course, um, and some qualifications that you pick up along the way, um, BCOM, Cert 3, Cert 4 and government investigations, licensed investigator, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's enough about me. Uh, I might pass back over to you, Roger. Thanks, Chris. Next slide, please. I, uh, I'm sure you won't often find people talk about forensics and use the term love like Malin did a couple of times, but it's awesome. You will from our team. We, we are quite passionate in what we do. So um, I, I want to give you um, a review of recent updates to fraud and corruption control frameworks. Now, now this applies whether, whether you're from uh, the government sector or the private sector. So whether you're Commonwealth, state or local government, or whether you're private sector, whether you're a, um, a small, medium or large or global or regional um, corporation or similar. And so um, these can be applied commensurate or proportionate to your organisation and operations. And so whether you're starting on that journey or whether you're quite mature, these will be some good checklists for you. Um, to look at your own organization's fraud and corruption control system or framework. Thanks, Chris. And here are some of those um, examples of anti-fraud better practice. So um, some of you may be aware of COZO, which is quite um, US originated, but they've got a fraud risk management guide that was recently updated 2023 version, second edition from a 2016 version. It doesn't necessarily apply per se in Australia, but it has some brilliant content that you can customise and apply to your organisation. There's the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners that you'll hear us talk about. They have an anti-fraud playbook and a whole lot of other things like a checkup um, checklist um, and a whole range of other things that are better practice. For Commonwealth Government, there's the classic Commonwealth Fraud Control Framework, which refers to also the next one down the bottom left-hand corner, which is the um, Australian Standard on Fraud and Corruption Control, AS8001 of 2021. If there's any guidance or standard that you can use, that would probably be the best one. And then there are a whole lot of the others that you can use to complement. So there's some from the Institute of Internal Auditors that you can see there and others like that, Managing the Business Risk of Fraud, a Practical Guide and Fraud Resistance. Some of these you can get freely on the internet if you Google these names. Um, others you might have to pay like Australian standards and standards you have to uh, pay for. Thanks, Chris. Um, there's also examples of investigations better practice, um, which come from the Australian standard on fraud and corrupt control, but also the Australian government investigation standard, um, which was revised this year, which is a great document. There's also something you may or may not have heard of, the OCEG, Open Compliance and Ethics Group, has a GRC, Governance Risk Compliance Capability Model with investigation information. And then there's also... You know, even if you're not government, but you're private sector, private sector can learn from some government better practice and vice versa. So the New South Wales ICAC, and, um, which is the Independent um, Corruption uh, Commission, and also the um, Victorian IBAC, Independent Broad-Based Anti-Corruption Commission, have some excellent investigation guides. Um, I won't go into that in more detail because Melinda will cover that more in his section. Thank you, Chris. So the Australian standard, I've shown this to you before, and this may be new to you. If it is, I certainly recommend that you buy it and have a good look at it. If you, you are well and truly mature in this, in your organisation of implementing it, I'm going to touch on some key points. Thanks, Chris. So foundational elements of fraud and corrupt control. We still find when we're regularly doing fraud reviews for clients that they don't necessarily have a specialised person or a person with specialist skills on fraud and corruption control. And we certainly suggest there needs to be a person often delegated by the CEO to have that responsibility. Awareness raising, so fraud and corruption control, employee awareness especially, we find that organisations still don't necessarily run those sort of training modules as frequently 
um, as they should. And also, often there's a good argument for making them compulsory. And when you if, when you do a deep dive as to how many people attend the training, you might find only 10 or 20% of your organisation do so. So you're missing out on some communicating of fraud and corruption control key information. Fraud and corruption risk management and a risk assessment is absolutely key. We still see some organisations, they may or may not have it in their strategic risk assessment for the organisation, but the next layer down of understanding the the, the more detailed key fraud and corruption uh, risks that are pertinent to the organisation. Um, development and management and implementing of a fraud and corruption control system or framework is absolutely key so that all of this is humming to complement your core business and mitigate the risks of fraud and corruption. And nowadays, of course, fraud control and cyber IT or security combine for, for prevention um, and detection and response to cyber fraud. So an information security management system working with this is absolutely key. Thanks, Chris. So the next slide is about prevention. And it's very key that your integrity framework, code of conduct or code of ethics is, is implemented. Internal controls and the internal control environment. Um, there's a there's a, a bubble up the top there with internal controls and the internal control environment and the recommendation from the Australian standard of pressure testing. If you want to know more about pressure testing, I highly recommend you go to the Commonwealth Fraud Prevention Centre. Just Google them. And, and even if you're not government, there's a lot of great information for private sector as well. And it has some detailed guides on how to do pressure testing and deep dives into internal control testing. And then workforce screening and screening and ongoing management of business associates like vendors and suppliers would still see that a common type of fraud is bogus vendors being created or being created by employees without you knowing and the destination bank account being an employee's bank account. Thanks, Chris. And then in detection, data analytics it doesn't have to be a multi-million dollar system. It can be simply your finance team running some key basic anti-fraud testing in the data that you've got available to you um, in your accounting system. And so we, we still see that some organisations need honing on this to actually take great advantage of what you've got to produce management exception reports and data analytic reports of anomalies. Fraud and corruption reporting channels and whistleblower management system I'll talk about in the following slide. So next slide, thanks, Chris. So this is on responding. So, you know, do you have an investigation response procedure or uh, protocol? And ideally that's documented. It's usually a Friday afternoon issue of, oh no, this has turned up, what do we do? What do we do with the person we think is suspected of some sort of improper conduct? What do we do with potentially a whistleblower or a public interest discloser that needs to be protected, et cetera? So have that, you know, have some thought of that and have that as a contingency plan that's ready to be activated. External reporting. Some organisations don't realise some of the external reporting bodies that are compulsory or that can be considered in the light of um, fraud and corruption control um, events that occur. Assessing internal controls, systems and processes post a fraud and corruption event is absolutely key and some of that pressure testing might be relevant in that as well. Thanks, Chris. Um, you may, this may be new to you, but there's also maturity assessment models that we apply to organisations that ask us to in some of their fraud reviews. And the Association of Certified Fraud Examiner have produced an anti-fraud playbook that has an excellent um, maturity assessment model for you to assess your own organisations or get us to assess um, your own uh, organisation's fraud and corrupt control system or framework. Other maturity models have come out. There's a great one there for Commonwealth Government of eight integrity principles and maturity indicators. There's also one from the New South Wales um, ICAC, Independent Commission Against Corruption, 
um, on their corruption, um, mature corruption controls guide. Thanks, Chris. Now, I'm going to talk about whistleblowing because it is absolutely key. So um, the majority of fraud and corruption is detected by someone having the courage to speak up, a whistleblower, a public interest discloser. It's essential that your, your organisation has that as a key entity level fraud control to for management to understand and receive confidentially reports of things that might be going wrong for attention. Thanks, Chris. So um, I want to talk to you. Yeah, you can open all those up. That's fine. The bystander effect. It's a hesitancy to take action by groupthink. And this is very connected to, um, you know, psychological safety in workplaces is so important these days. So the bystander effect is a social psychological phenomena where individuals are less likely to help a victim when others are present, which is counterintuitive. But the greater the number of bystanders, the less likely any one of them is to help. I've seen this myself on public transport when an incident occurs and no one seems to act. And then if I act, and I have in the past, others will help and support. The most frequently cited real-life example of the bystander effect regards a young woman who was murdered in New York in 1964, while several of her neighbours unfortunately looked on. No one intervened until it was too late. This can be applied to fraud and corruption that people observe in the workplace. The message here is the behaviour you walk past is the behaviour you endorse. And silence is agreement in my view. So if you ignore it, you've endorsed it. Um, thanks, Chris. So there's a whole lot of leading practice examples on whistleblowing. Um, there are some examples there. You'll get a copy of these slides. ASIC has done an excellent job in producing some better practice guidance and legislation or from their legislation on whistleblower policies and also good practice for handling whistleblower disclosures. There's an Association of Certified Fraud Examiners Guide. There's a Transparency International Guide. There's an international standard on whistleblowing. So there's no shortage of guidance on this. But of course, overarching is comply with your legislation first and then look at these better practices for some help um, to implement these. Thanks, Chris. And so that's just an example that ACFE um, better practice or best in class whistleblower hotline program. I won't go into the detail at this point, but you'll get these slides and you can um, have a look at this. Thanks, Chris. So you've seen this slide before, but just so to reinforce in Asia Pacific, including in Australia, 58% um, of fraud is detected by a tip off, by someone having the courage to speak up. And so then you see internal audit is also important, management review, document examination, etc. cetera. Um, you can click on the next one, uh, Chris, thanks. And if you want to know, 55% of those 58% of the way fraud is detected is um, communicated by employees. Customers are 18%, anonymous is 16%, even vendors 10%, and it goes on. Thanks, Chris. So this is a, a great, Navex Global is a global whistleblower provider for often uh, global organisations, and they produce some great um, studies and research from their um, data. This is an example of that, of it's almost like the Me Too movement whistleblowing is. It's, it's, this is the massive trend of countries around the world to update, revise and implement legislation to protect whistleblowers. And we're no different with examples of public sector, um, public interest disclosure legislation for Commonwealth and state and also the private sector with the Corporations Act whistleblower legislation, which is amazing and quite leading practice at the moment. Thank you, Chris. Um, just to finish up on this slide, and you can just open them all up, Chris. Um, I thought you'd like some tips from Navex Global on uh, their study on why whistleblower reporting avenues can be less effective, absence of clear ownership of who looks after it, avoid confusion as to 
who looks after the, the whistleblower program, employ mistrust, warning sign of low reporting numbers, fear of retaliation, afraid to challenge management. So training and confidence is important here. Outdated um, report logging processes that don't work or they're like nine to five. And so people might want to, if, if I had a burning whistleblower issue, I'd probably report it out of hours. And so do the processes still work then? Lack of awareness, people don't know where to report and an absence of management buy-in. Talk the talk and walk the walk. Thank you, Chris. I think that's the last of my slides and I'll hand over to you, Chris. Awesome. Thank you, Roger. Um, so I'll be covering artificial intelligence and its links to fraud. So what to look out for and how we can take advantage of artificial intelligence to actually improve our fraud and corruption control system um, prevention, detection, response measures. So uh, it's important to note that half of all organisations currently use artificial intelligence. And 63% of organisations say they plan to increase their investment in artificial intelligence over the next three years. Um, one of the issues that this may raise, though, is um, some organisations are increasing their investment in artificial intelligence, but they're not necessarily increasing the resources or the spends in mitigating the risks associated with using artificial intelligence. And to exemplify this, um, the global cybercrime damage costs um, used to be about six trillion US dollars a year, which is, um, for context, one hundred ninety thousand US dollars a second, a second, um, and that's expected to be ten point five trillion dollars annually by twenty twenty five. So cybercrime costs a lot of money across the globe. Um, and a large part of this is um, fraud, cyber attacks, um, and either poor use of artificial intelligence, which opens up um, opportunities for fraudsters to attack your IT systems and your cybersecurity, um, or the um, fraudsters actually using artificial intelligence for nefarious purposes. But before we get too far down the rabbit hole, what is artificial intelligence? So um, there was an example a couple of slides ago um, of a robot lifting up a box. Um, and that is actually one example of artificial intelligence is getting a robot to do tasks that typically a human would do. Um, but for the rest of these slides, we're really going to be talking about generative AI. So generative artificial intelligence is an assistant that can make things from prompts. Typically, it gives you a response when you put in a prompt or a question, um, and usually it's in a conversational type way. Um, so the artificial intelligence has been trained on large data sets, so a lot of data, pictures, music, text, all sorts of data. It then uses this knowledge and this data to create new content and responses that look, sound, or feel similar to answer your prompt or your question. Some examples that you may know of, of generative AI, are ChatGPT, Bing Chat, which is Microsoft's um, version of generative AI, or Google's Bard, which is, of course, Google's version of generative AI. Um, just a note on this, um, ChatGPT is probably the most well-known, um, but interestingly, it only has data up until about November 2021. Um, so some of the responses that you get from it may not be um, up-to-date or relevant as of um, November 2023, uh, whereas Bing Chat or Google's Bard um, have data all the way up until today. So what does that actually look like when you're using it? Um, I think we've lost Chris. Oh. And makes it easier for 
uh, to access the generative AI than, say, Google's Bard, where you actually need a Google account, you need sorry. to log into it, et cetera. Chris, sorry to interrupt. We just lost you for a minute and lost the slides. So if you want to um, refresh and show the slides again and just, just go back 30 seconds, I suppose, in the information. Absolutely. Um, bear with me for a moment. Um, oh. Can you see the slides, Roger and Melinda? Yep, we can see that now. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so just taking a step back, 15, 20 seconds or so. Um, so I was using Bing Chat uh, for this example um, because it's just easier to access um, than Google's part um, where you require a Google account to actually log into it. Um, but both are fantastic generative AI tools. So this is an example where um, generative AI gives you a really sensible, accurate, fantastic answer to the prompt that you're actually putting in. So I said to it, tell me about Australian Standard 8001 2021, which Roger talked about earlier. The response that um, Bing Chat gave me was AS 8001 2021 is a current Australian standard that provides minimum requirements and additional guidance for organisations wishing to develop, implement and maintain an effective fraud and corruption control system. That's an excellent answer. Um, and it gives me a flavour of what it's actually about. Um, I can then ask my own follow-up questions or it sort of suggests um, some follow-up questions as well. One of the suggested ones here was how does it differ from um, international standard 37001? And it gives a really good answer on this as well. Um, so it says AS8001 2021 covers fraud and corruption, whereas the international standard focuses on anti-bribery. So this is an example of a really sensible answer. However, please take caution when you're using generative AI to assist you um, in your um, work, your operations, your fraud and corruption control system. Um, this is an example of getting a nonsensical answer from generative AI. So um, in this particular case, I'm trying to ask Bing Chat, where does Christopher Scott live? And I'm referring to myself. And it said, there are many people named Christopher Scott in the world. Do you have any more information about the person you're looking for? Are you searching for Christopher Scott, a furniture maker in Langwari, Victoria? Are you searching for Chris Scott, a former Australian footballer and current coach of Geelong Football Club? And that's often the one that I get when I Google myself um, or I put myself into um, generative AI. So in this particular case, it hasn't answered my question very well. It hasn't given me a sensible answer to what um, I'm actually trying to look for. So please do take caution. Um, and do a bit of a sense check as to the output you're actually getting from generative AI when you do use it. It's not completely foolproof. It can definitely help, but it's not completely fool foolproof. So speaking of ways that generative AI can help us, so how it can be used for good, it can be used to provide a list of industry and process specific fraud prevention and detection activities, controls, processes for us to be able to mitigate fraud and corruption control risks. It can provide us with examples as to how artificial intelligence can be used to commit fraud and therefore we can use that knowledge to try and prevent that from happening. It can list out steps for internal auditors to incorporate in their plans to detect fraud during an internal audit. It can tell us about fraud trends and how to protect against them. You might get a list of ways that artificial intelligence can be leveraged in the fight against fraud, um, particularly in detective measures, such as identifying patterns and anomalies in data, automating fraud detection, predictive analysis or trend analysis, and enhance risk assessment tools. And it can also help you with um, uh, preparing your fraud control awareness training and what to actually put into that training for employees. One final caution 
if you are going to use generative AI either for um, fraud and corruption mitigation um, or for any other purpose in your organisation, um, is these um, generative AI tools that I mentioned earlier, so ChatGPT, Bing Chat, Google's Bard, are publicly available information. And if you input into the prompt that you're asking confidential or sensitive information, it will remember that. And all of a sudden, that is now publicly available information for anyone to um, access and use if they're using those AI tools. We'll talk about a solution um, to that and how you might um, protect your organisation again against um, employees accidentally leaking confidential information when using artificial intelligence just a little bit later on. So here's some examples as to how AI can be used for bad. So what are fraudsters using AI for? And it's important to note this so that we can um, think about this and actually respond to it and try and mitigate these risks. So fraudsters are using um, what's called Worm GPT. There's, there's other variants as well, but Worm GPT is sort of the most common one at the moment um, to launch large scale phishing emails, hacking campaigns, et cetera. And they're getting the AI to basically um, generate these phishing emails that are going out to people um, on a very large scale, very quickly, um, and with very few spelling, grammatical mistakes, et cetera. AI is being used to create malware and viruses. So um, fraudsters who have successfully created malware and viruses have been sharing in ChatGPT um, with other fraudsters how to write code um, for malware viruses, how to steal data, how to install backdoors um, to security on software, et cetera. AI can be used um, to learn how to encrypt data to produce ransomware. And it can be used for the opposite, to figure out how to decrypt data. So if an organization has confidential or sensitive information that is encrypted, how do I actually go about decrypting that information? And then one that's a little bit um, left field is in romance fraud. Um, so romance fraud being where a fraudster sets up um, an account or a series of accounts on dating sites, and they try to um, build a connection with people and get those people to pay them money. Um, so fraudsters are using AI or bots to maintain multiple profiles in attempts at committing romance fraud. And in particular, as an example here on the next slide, um, profile pictures. So um, this is um, a social media account of um, someone called Katie Jones. Um, now, the only problem with this is Katie Jones doesn't exist. Katie Jones is not a real person. This is an AI generated profile. And the profile picture is also AI generated. And it looks pretty realistic. And if you don't know what to look for, you could think it's realistic. There are a couple of little things to look out for. Um, just at the moment, the artificial intelligence is not perfect. Um, the scary news is it will get better. But at the moment, things to look out for um, is here we can see that the earring uh, is a bit smudged. It's a bit blurry um, and it doesn't look completely realistic. We can see here on the cheek there's a few smudge lines. The eyes are different colours, um, although that can actually happen. That is a um, legitimate thing that some people have is different coloured eyes. Um, but it is quite rare. Um, and then an indistinct background um, so that's um, sort of very blurry, um, doesn't have a, any detail behind it. So there are some giveaways at the moment. Um, the scary news is it will get more and more difficult to um, pick those out. But even at the moment, it looks very realistic. This is a really interesting case study um, of what not to do when using generative AI. Um, and this comes back to the point I raised right at the start, which is just take caution when you're using generative AI tools to assist you um, in your operations in fighting fraud and corruption. Um, so 
This guy on the right here uh, is a lawyer and he used ChatGPT to help him write up a legal brief for a court case. The only problem is the uh, case law and the reasons for the decisions of past cases um, where judges have been cited in this legal brief were completely made up. This is not actually what judges have said in the past in relation to case law. Um, so this person was fined for um, essentially just using chat GPT, having false case law uh, that he didn't review. Um, and then the judge presiding over this case uh, made him uh, personally apologise to every single judge that was named in the legal brief as well. Uh, so a great example of what not to do when using generative AI and uh, you don't want to be like Stephen Schwartz, um, who was the lawyer on the right there. So what can you do to mitigate risks when you're using generative AI tools and your employees are using generative AI tools? Make sure that you have a robust information security management system and make sure that that security management system considers artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence. Have an artificial intelligence acceptable use policy, procedure, guideline for your employees, which will tell your employees what they can and can't do in relation to using artificial intelligence. Include in IT awareness training for employees how to use artificial intelligence and how not to use artificial intelligence, as well as AI fraud methods and what to look out for. Note, um, this is a rapidly changing environment. Um, artificial intelligence moves very quickly. And therefore, um, if you're including this in your IT awareness training, you'll just have to be conscious um, that you're actually updating your material um, as the artificial intelligence evolves and the fraud schemes evolve. And consider producing um, a secure generative AI assistant tailored for your organization in your organization's environment. And that may involve partnering with a Microsoft or Google, whoever it is. Um, so RSM has actually um, partnered with one of these providers to create a secure environment. And basically our employees can use this secure artificial intelligence tool that is not publicly available. Um, so we don't have the issue of putting in confidential sensitive information and, and essentially now it's available to the public. It's our own tool, which is secure to our um, organization and our organization's environment. And it's also tailored to the sorts of things that we would use generative AI for in our organization as well, which is a little bit different to um, what you may use artificial intelligence for. So now I'll hand over to Melissa. Lint, uh, who's going to be talking about best practice investigations. Malint. Thank you, Chris. So, yes, ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk about best practice investigations, including cross-border. If, you know, you're in, in your, the way you work, you do have subsidiaries overseas or you're a multinational company and you might have to, you know, investigate overseas. So we'll look at better practice or best practice there. But you could also apply those sets of uh, processes here locally in Australia too. So next slide, slide, please, Chris. So before we get into the nitty gritties of it all, let's let's paint a scenario for everyone on this webinar to consider. So there's five there. So let's start with an example that you're, you're an investigator here in Australia and you work for a multinational company, simple enough. You've then been asked to conduct an investigation of an employee who has been allegedly accepting kickbacks from a vendor. So far, again, seems straightforward uh, on what you need to do for investigating this allegation. Now, this is where the complexity kicks in and you've got other strands uh, to this. So that employee, you know, allegedly receiving the kickbacks actually works at a subsidiary company of yours in Singapore. So now we're adding in another jurisdiction, another country. That vendor is based in India, and that employee that you're going to be investigating actually accepted the kickback in Japan. So you see where I'm going with this. There's, there's other things 
happening. And then to top it all off, that employee that you're about to investigate is actually a citizen of Canada. So if you just open that up, Chris, it's the, for fraud's sake, there's so many things to consider where you start off with a, you know, pretty, you know, simple investigation of someone allegedly accepting kickbacks from a vendor, but then you start adding in different you know, countries, language barriers, potentially different laws in the different countries, Singapore, Japan, whatnot, data privacy issues to consider the security of the data that you're going to be looking into. So lots of things to consider. So I thought to start paint a picture that it can get really complex. I'm not saying that you know, you might have to investigate one of these in the future, but uh, it can get quite messy. But we'll try and unravel all of it for you in the short time we have. So next slide, please, Chris. So how how do you go about investigating, you know, these sorts of uh, complex investigation, which, which could cross borders? Uh, you know, there's, uh, I'll share with you two better practices that, that are out there. Uh, the first is from the OECG, which Roger touched on very briefly at the start of this webinar. And they've got this really awesome investigation process and I'll touch on the five areas. I appreciate it's a busy slide and you'll get a copy of this, but it all starts with the investigation triggers. Point number one then, you can open that up, Chris. It is, how does that investigation come to your uh, to your desk, uh, you know, is it from internal triggers that has happened through some of the data that you're reviewing, or has it come from a whistleblower, a hotline service that you might have internally, uh, a tip has come through, or, you know, externally, you've got the ombudsman calling you and letting you know that there's something happened or media uh, article has come on. So there's, there's a trigger event that, that comes in. And then from there, You've got to triage it. Point number two, Chris, if you can just click there, is, is trying to understand what you're dealing with, how complex it is. Does it span borders? Is it quite highly politicized? Is it sensitive? You know, what sort of stakeholders you need to involve potentially? Are there multiple persons of interest, witnesses? So, so you're going to triage it. And then from there, you're going to have the investigation plan. So plan and assign. Point number three is you're going to investigate the issue. You're going to basically understand what the allegation is. What is the scope that you're going to be looking at? You're going to identify the players. You know, if there's one person of interest, two, three, whatnot, how many witnesses there might be that you're going to contact and try and elicit as much information as possible. Uh, crucially, over here, you're also going to identify your, your A team, who is going to be your investigation team, who's going to assist in this investigation. It could be you know, your general counsel internally, or you could have a, your legal representative. You might have an external firm to help you there. That could, that could be part of your team. You could also have forensic technology experts if you need to capture mobile phones or get emails from the, the individual or the company. You could have linguistic experts. So you're going to identify your team and then you can also identify, you know, where are the sources of information, your investigative procedures? What are you going to be doing? So the plan has to be documented clearly. No, it's okay. You can open it, uh, Chris. And then once you have that in place, you know, conduct the investigation. So whatever you've mentioned in your plan, conduct the investigations, make those inquiries, look at the data, speak to your witnesses, corroborate the information and I might add the the investigation plan is a is a living breathing document it's not set in stone so you can always go back to it you know and and tweak it as you need it so you conduct the investigation and then finally point number five is what is the outcome the remediation you've got the report is the allegation substantiated not substantiated what do you do with the individual so in my previous example you know that employee who's allegedly received a kickback if you can prove that allegation what happens then is it a disciplinary process do you fire the individual etc so uh, that's a good investigation process the common pitfalls on the right hand side i won't go through all of that but you know the the, the first 72 hours are quite crucial but also we you don't want to go in really fast and not have things documented you want to have a, a you know it's like building a house you want to have a good solid foundation 
before you can start you know, investigating. And then have an open mind. Don't think that whatever you hear first is what is true. Just have an open mind and keep on investigating. On the next slide, Chris, thank you very much, is another approach, another process. It's called the fraud theory approach from the ACFE. Again, an awesome resource that we use. And it all starts with predication. You know, it's similar to the investigation triggers. Is there predication to investigate this matter? Or are you literally going on a fishing expedition because someone has said something? Or as that individual, if it's coming from a tip, do they have con you know, do they have specific details as to what has happened? So you want to make sure there's predication in place before you go down that path of investigating the matter. So you want to evaluate the tips, or if it's from an accounting issue, if you're looking at your internal audit, or if you're doing data analytics and you've come across some suspicious transactions, red flags. You're going to review it and you might think, mm, okay, this is strange. Maybe we need to go and look into much detail. So if there's predication, you'll continue on with your fraud theory approach. If there's not, you know, you stop it right there and you park it. But if there is, uh, on the next slide, Chris, you will then go ahead and create your fraud theory approach. So similar to a investigation plan, you know, who are the players what has happened? What are the allegations? What are some of the methods that they might be hiding assets or money? How is the fraud perpetrated? So it's all going to be developing that theory. And then you're going to come and think about, okay, where am I going to get all this information from? Where can I source the evidence? Is it internal, external? Who am I going to be speaking to? You know, am I going to be doing open source intelligence searches, forensic due diligence, et cetera? So where is the evidence likely to be? And then, you know, is the evidence there to prove intent? Is it only going to happen once or is it going to happen multiple times? So again, you want to develop that fraud theory approach. And again, revise that theory because it's not set in stone. You could go back to multiple times to, to beef it up, essentially. And then on the next slide there, Chris, is once you've got predication, you've got a fraud theory approach, there's enough to proceed. It's when that's when you start conducting the investigation and you'll go through your investigative procedures, conduct your interviews, collect all the evidence you have, and then come up with a, a report and then remediation from there. Thank you, Chris. On the next slide, so... Conducting investigations is tricky, is difficult, and there's language and cultural differences. It doesn't matter if you're doing a cross-border investigation, even locally, if you're doing it in Australia, you know, we are a diverse population here in Australia. The people you're investigating, the persons of interest or the witnesses that you might be speaking to uh, might have uh, different language, you know, might be different language barriers from another background. So Things to consider when conducting investigations and language barriers is, is, is a big one. You know, you might think everyone can, you know, has a good command of English. Uh, it might not be the case. So something to consider. And it's quite important, definitely in conducting interviews, if you're speaking to someone who's not of English background, uh, speaking background, because things can get lost in translation, can get misinterpreted. So you want to make sure that when you're conducting those interviews, you might have someone with you who can assist in that language barrier there. And also when you're an analyzing information, emails, when doing a document review or email review searches, there might be uh, emails in a different language, uh, which might be, again, a barrier uh, when you're conducting um, the procedure. So again, keep that in mind. Chris talked about AI. Uh, you can definitely use AI to use technology to assist in trying to you know, decipher some of these emails. You can use chat GPT. There's something called Google Translate also you can make use of, but just a bit of warning that it's not perfect and some of the messaging can be lost. On the next slide, Chris. So look, from language barriers, we got body language. Again, very, very crucial in conducting investigations and you know interviewing people so nonverbal cues are quite critical and they had can have different meanings across 
different cultures. So Western cultures, you know, maintaining eye contact during a conversation is a sign of attentiveness, honesty, respect. But on the flip side, in some Asian cultures, you know, prolonged eye contact can be considered as impolite and confrontational. So you just got to be aware of that uh, and be aware when you're conducting interviews in that sense. And then the last uh, sub bullet point there is quite interesting. A thumbs up, you know, is a sign of approval in most countries, but in several countries in West Africa and in the, in, in the Middle East, a thumbs up is actually the equivalent of the middle finger. So uh, uh, just a bit of tip there. Next slide, please, Chris. Now look, investigations across the world, your know, data protection, if you're conducting investigations, data protection is quite crucial. And there's this really good tip here for everyone on this webinar is there's this website from DLA Piper. They've got a free tool that has got all the countries in the world that they've looked in and all the data protection laws for that region or for that country. So a great tip to have. Uh, on the next slide, Chris, I've put in three examples, and I won't go through it, but you know, Singapore, they'll have the data protection laws there. Uh, if you just click through again, there's Australia, and then there's also uh, the UK. So just examples given there, but you can literally key in the country and it'll give you a whole list there. Next, Chris, thank you. So moving on to forensic due diligence, investigative due diligence. So it's essentially, and, and quite crucial in investigations when you're trying to corroborate information that you have already received or trying to you know, gather new information. So it's literally uncovering of information. So what can you find, which is out there in the World Wide Web or even in public seminars, uh, or, or sorry, in public uh, records and public registries. So it's trying to essentially uncover the unknown. On the next slide, please, Chris. So what are some of the tools available to you? My God, there is so much out there. It's unbelievable. It's literally limited by your imagination. So I spoke about OSINT, Open Source Intelligence, and that can be public records here in Australia. You know, you got ASIC. Uh, they've got uh, the PPSR if you're looking for assets. There's the Bankruptcy Registry uh, Registrar, the AFSA. So lots of public records. Uh, out there, there's also public information, which is available to you and I publicly, legal databases to look through called Worldly or Osly. There's also called something called Dogpile, which you might not have heard from, but that actually is a website which has all the popular search engines of Google, Yahoo, Bing, etc., Hey, look, there's a there's a website called the Wayback Machine. If you've not seen it or heard of it before, please click on it. It actually what it is is if there is a website or you've been told in an investigation that this company had a website, you might go on, but it doesn't exist anymore and it's been taken down. This Internet Archive website actually archives uh, records from previous months and years, and you might uh, strike it lucky and find it there. And look, and then social media searches, there's heaps and heaps and heaps on LinkedIn, social media that you can even use to your advantage. And I might hand over to Roger for the last slide. Thank you, Melinda. Excellent. And thank you, Melinda and Chris. Um, I'm going to finish this slide and then I might take over the Q&A very quickly since we've only got a minute or two. Um, this is a little bit self-serving, but we happen to be RSM Australia, our fraud and forensic services team, the exclusive authorised trainers in Australia to run the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners CFE, Certified Fraud Examiner, exam review course to assist people in a four-day instructor-led course to sit the exams and become certified fraud examiners. We've got courses coming up um, in April next year in person in Melbourne, and then a virtual one in July and October. Um, next uh, click, please, Chris. So that has a day on investigation, a day on international legal principles, a day on financial transactions and fraud schemes, and a day on fraud prevention and deterrence. We find a high demand for this as there's actually quite a lack of available, excellent training, qualifications, credentials for people in this space. And 
we get people from private sector, public sector, especially if they have fraud control responsibilities um, doing this course um, and getting that insight. Next slide, please, Chris. So q and I might <clears throat> pick up on some of the questions. So, um, and I might just have a quick grab at some of them. Um, so uh, workforce screening, how has this affected impact, affected impacted with the rise of AI in place? Chris, I might get you to take that on notice and I'll get you to answer that in a minute. Um, uh, one one um, inquiry is a small not-for-profit charity. It is very hard to get this taken on board, but it is where a lot of issues happen. Do you have any advice? And look, yes, there is also an Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, which has a page on protect your charity from, um, from fraud. So I strongly recommend referring to that. And also, um, there's a lot of good business case information on why this should be the case um, of focusing on fraud and corruption control. And one example is often with a lot of not-for-profits, there's government funding and they do require a certain level of fraud and corruption control system and, and framework um, in place to trust the organisation with, with funds. Um, there's a few questions on whistleblowing. Uh, I, we do find that whistleblowers, are pro uh, the great majority of the predication or the reason for us doing investigation for clients. Uh, and I can't comment on the, the ATO PWC whistleblower, but if you look on the media, that's quite a complicated issue. And that is the Commonwealth Public Interest Disclosure Legislation. There are some restrictions with um, especially government um, public interest disclosure legislation that the private sector, believe it or not, um, Corporations Act uh, whistleblower legislation has gone over and above. And so they're better practice examples from often other quite outdated policies, procedures. Um, if you need to log out, we understand, but I'll just um, hand over to Chris for a minute to answer that uh, first question, if you can um, stay there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Roger. Um, so uh, the question, uh, again, is in relation to workforce screening, how has this been affected, impacted with the rise of artificial intelligence in place? Um, this is a really good question. And um, when you're doing any um, workforce screening, vendor screening, um, any real um, looking into the legitimacy of a particular organisation, person, set of documents, um, you have to be really uh, aware of the fact that artificial intelligence can be used to falsify, manipulate, create completely fictitious documentation in relation to supporting um, someone's credentials, um, their identity, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, so um, you probably need to be um, a bit more conscious of that than we ever have been in the past. Um, uh, ensure that you are actually talking to uh, the person who you think you're talking to. Um, ha have a look for some common um, red flags in relation to um, manipulated documentation. Um, so, um, you know, text um, might look a little bit funny. Um, it might be different fonts, might be different sizes. Um, you know, they haven't actually um, provided... Um, the types of information that you actually requested in relation to ID documents. Um, it might be missing things like um, the, the hologram um, in, in the photocopy. So obviously there's a little um, hologram of say your driver's license or your passport, for example. Um, it might be missing those little details if it's been artificial, uh, generated via artificial intelligence, um, but definitely something to consider um, uh, in a lot more detail than we probably have done in the past. And I think that's a really good question. Thanks, Chris. Um, we're a couple of minutes over, so apologies. Um, we'll finish up there. We didn't get to all the questions. Happy for you to contact us direct and we can have a discussion. Um, I thank everybody for um, participating in, in attending um, our webinar from RSM Australia and our Fraud and Forensic Services team and thank our co-presenters um, Melinda and Chris, and also our national marketing people who have been amazing. And I, we wish you um, all the best in International Fraud Awareness Week this week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.